from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African and Middle East Division of the Library of Congress. Today's lecture on the translation of the Persian classic, the Shahnameh, Rendering Epic, Translator as Reciter, by Ahmad Sadre, is sponsored by the Near East Section of the African and Middle East Division. I'm Joan Weeks, head of the Near East Section. On behalf of all my colleagues, and in particular, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, who can't be with us today, she's the chief of the division, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone. But before we start today's program, we always like to give you a brief overview of our division and its resources in the hopes that you'll come back and join us and use these wonderful collections for your own research. This division is comprised of three sections that build and serve the collections to researchers around the world. We cover 78 countries and more than 35 languages. The African section includes countries in all of Sub-Sahara Africa. The Hebraic section is responsible for Judaica and Hebraica worldwide. And the Near East section covers all of the Arab countries, including North Africa, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, the Muslims in Western China, Russia and the Balkans, and the peoples of the Caucasus. So you can see our collections and our specialists are very, very busy. After the program, we would like to invite you to fill in the evaluation forms that we've left in your seats, and you can take them up to the information desk as you are leaving. We would also like to remind you that this program is being videotaped, and if you would like to ask questions, you're giving your permission to be recorded. So now I would like to invite my colleague, Harad Dinavari, our Persian world specialist to the podium to introduce our speaker. Harad? First of all, I wanna thank you very much for coming on a lovely wintry day uh, during lunch break. I realize most people have busy schedules and getting around in DC is not easy, especially our speaker and his lovely wife who flew all the way in and uh, had a delay. So I'm delighted that they made it. We're happy to have them. And I would like to take a second and say that um, Mr. Ahmad Sadri was featured in our lovely exhibit that we had last year, um, A Thousand Years of the Persian Book. We showcased the Shahnameh uh, translation that he would be talking about. The illustrations were done by Hamid Rahmanian, but the actual translation work has been done by him. And it's uh, a beautiful work. If you have not uh, seen it or purchased it, I think the bookstore does still have an issue or two for sale, or you can buy it online. It's a wonderful uh, book, and we've done our part uh, promoting it um, in the past year or two at the library. Um, Dr. Ahmad Sadri received his BA and MA degree in sociology from the University of Tehran and his PhD in the same field from the New School of Social Research in New York City. He is the author of Max Weber's Sociology of Intellectuals, Oxford University Press, 1992, that was chosen as a academic book of the year by Choice Magazine of the American Library Association. As a public intellectual, Dr. Sadri has written more than 140 articles, including uh, regular editorial columns for the Daily Star of Lebanon and Etemade Milli of Iran. He has written two books in Persian, uh, reviving uh, the concept of civilization and the, uh, a, 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 how, do you, how do you say it? <laughs> Thank you, exactly. Um, Apocalypse Soon, Sadri's uh, English translations include Saddam City from Arabic, and Reason, Freedom and Democracy in Islam from Persian. His most recent work is the abridged translation of the Epic of the Persian Kings, the Shahnameh, which is the focus of this talk, published in um, 2005, and has received uh, enthusiastic reviews from Atlantic Monthly, Wall Street Journal, CNN Online, NPR, All Things Considered, 
uh, of NPR, Guardian, uh, The Federalist, and Roll Paper. Uh, Dr. Sadri has uh, regular contributions on television, radio shows as, such as BBC, CBC, NPR, VOA, and WGN. I don't want to take too much time because I know he has a lovely presentation, and I'm going to ask him to come up and give us a, a lovely lecture. Thank you. Did you catch that Persian uh, quote that was exchanged between me and myself and Hirat? I think some of you did. There are some Persian speakings in presence, and there are some who don't speak Persian but uh, are in love with the epic of the Persian kings. And uh, that is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, Shahnameh, or the Book of the Kings, is indeed a Persian icon. Uh, that is myself at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, viewing uh, the folios from Shahnameh Shah Tahmasp uh, or Hutton Shahnameh. And if you are around New York, I highly recommend that you go there and view these magnificent works of art. Uh, a Shahnameh that was uh, commissioned by an Iranian king for the, an Ottoman emperor and uh, that is on display. Um, Metropolitan Museum has about 86 or so, uh, if I'm not mistaken, folios of that, of that book. Just absolutely magnificent. Also, the uh, curator of uh, the Islamic section of the Metropolitan, uh, Sheila Camby, wrote the introduction to uh, this particular translation that uh, we have provided. So um, I want to come clean and share with you uh, how daunting it was to attempt uh, the translation of the Epic of the Persian King, given that it is such an icon uh, in Iran. It is, among other things, the longest poem ever written by a single human being, about twice the size of Iliad and Odyssey put together, 120,000 lines. Um, about 10,000 lines have been lost over uh, the years. And when I say over the years, it has been 1,005 years since the author of the book, Ferdosi, put down the pen and said, thank God I'm done with the, uh, with, the, with the great book that I have written. It took him 33 years, 33 years to write this book. Uh, and you have the dates right there. 977 he started, and he ended 1010 Christian era. That is how long ago it was. And uh, this is a time uh, of somebody who has done this kind of work without computers, uh, without the delete and uh, cut and paste button, uh, just pen and paper. And he had a scribe that he loved very much. And so basically, uh, he completed the work in 1010, March 8, 1010, and uh, was very happy to have been uh, involved in the work, and he believed that his name would be perpetuated for this wonderful work that he has done. And indeed, we are sitting here in Washington, D.C., Library of the Congress, 105 years later, uh, and we are still talking about Ferdowsi. He basically ruined himself uh, financially doing this work, and he died in abject poverty, although he was a well-to-do landowner. Uh, I dare say he did the right thing. He, his, his gamble paid off, and he uh, perpetuated himself in the pages of history. Very quickly, uh, the book uh, contains three parts. There is myth, there is epic, and there is history. The one thirtieth, the, a thin layer of the book in the very beginning is myth, and it's about the mythological kings of Persia. These are civilization-building kings. And in the um, first slide that I showed you, on the right-hand side, there is a picture, a relief of one of these kings, King Tahmures, which is on the doors of this library. I rushed in, so I haven't seen it yet. I have only seen pictures of it, but on the way I, out, I very much intend to stand there and take a, a look at the image of Tahmures, the mythological king. 
and it is, uh, I, I looked, it, uh, uh, looked around it for a while and, and, and actually located the artist who was fashioning the doors and uh, was wondering where he got the information. He gets all the iconography, all the attributes right about this particular king. Uh, king Tahmuras in Shahnameh, it is called Tahmuras Divband, the demon binding king. And so, uh, the, the beginning it starts with myth, the first two thirds is epic, and the last one third is history. I basically decided to do the epic part, the mythological and epic part, not get into the historical part, because uh, you know, his, history is about people and some people are boring. So myth is never boring. The mythological heroes are never boring. And if you uh, get into the Shahnameh, I mean, I think uh, my translation is a good, uh, starter, if you're interested in getting into the stories, it has four sweeping uh, uh, tragedies, uh, tragedies of Sohrab and Siavash and Furud and Esfandiar, uh, as grand as any great Shakespeare um, play that you might read, uh, and uh, four fantastic love stories um, of Rudabe, Tahmine, uh, Farangis, and Manije. These are all, all the four names I mentioned, there are few female names. Why did I not mention the male counter counterparts? Because actually these females, in the, these four grand love stories of Shahnameh, they are not the retiring type sitting and waiting for their knight in the shining armor. This is a thousand years ago. Right? They are not waiting for the knight in the shi uh, shining armor to arrive and sweep them off their feet. They take the initiative. They seduce the knight. And, and when the occasion calls, they are not above uh, uh, drugging and abducting the knight that they love. These are not your regular you know, mythic uh, fair ladies. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in Shahnameh, you, you're in for a great surprise. These are grand stories. And the advantage for the enviable position of somebody who hasn't read them is that you don't know what's going to happen at the end. When you read the um, King Oedipus, it's wonderful, it's grand, but you know what's going to happen at the end. If you are not Persian, you don't know what's going to happen at the end of Rostam and Sohrab. Father and son meet unbeknownst to one another, and the father this time kills the son. There, I gave away the end of that one story, but that is, uh, that is a, a, a taste of what uh, people can expect in the Shahnameh. So, um, the reason that Iranians speak the way they do today, the Persian language, the stability of this language over a millennium is due to the Shahnameh. Some have argued convincingly the reason that Persians did not Arabize the way Egyptians did or Syrians did is that Persians didn't put all of their eggs in the basket of their religion. Some of the eggs were in the basket of language and uh, mythology, and so that is how they got to preserve it. And Ferdowsi has a great role to play in stabilizing the language, expanding the, the language, and by creating this amazing um, work, he really uh, became an icon of the language. Every Iranian that you see, no matter how uh, remote they might be, every Persianate person that you can see, people who speak Persian language, the Tajiks, the uh, various groups in Afghanistan, the Hazaras, um, all the way to parts of India, parts of uh, uh, Central Asia, uh, they all will be able to quote you a couple of lines of Shahnameh. Uh, this is in the very marrow of the bone of the Iranian culture. It is of the essence of the Iranian uh, culture and language. Now, you might wonder uh, how I dared to translate this. It is really daunting, and it is really going where angels fear to tread. And I will tell you how I did it. Uh, I, I plucked up courage because uh, Shahnameh, uh, very much like other great epic works, 
such as Iliad and Odyssey, we know those works were also orally transmitted. There were performers of Iliad and Odyssey who would stand up in public. It is the world of most people being not literate, and they recited these works. We know this only by inference, by some formulaic repetitions in Iliad and Odyssey. The tradition of recitation of Shahnameh, live recitation of Shahnameh, is still alive. And this gentleman that you see here is one such reciter of Shahnameh. And I will share with you that the first time that I encountered the Shahnameh, it was not the book that I opened up and I read. It was when I saw one of these performers. When I was about eight years old, and uh, in some sleepy afternoon, just I ventured out of the house of one of my relatives where we were guests, and there it was, a coffee house and a performer, exactly like this gentleman, who walked back and forth, clapped his hands, shouted, did sound uh, effects uh, of horses running and... Uh, uh, swords clanging and all these, uh, you know, heroes talking back and forth in poetry to one another. I was absolutely mesmerized by, by the story. And I remember to this day, almost 50 years later, I remember every word that he said. And I also remember every image I made in my mind as he was speaking. I remember it so well that... When I read the Shahnameh, I know it is not there. There are a lot of additional stories that these performers add to the Shahnameh. So uh, this gave me courage. I am another performer. I am another reciter. I am another naqal. For a different audience, in a different time, and I felt that Ferdowsi, the author, gives me permission to liberally approach his work and try to uh, uh, tell his stories to new audiences. The new audiences from a digital age. And uh, these first impressions, this is one of the uh, images made by Hamid Rahmanian. It's a night raid. And uh, Hamid has kind of uh, a little bit messed with, uh, with, with, the, with the both forms of uh, uh, miniature and uh, lithograph, he has created these uh, silhouettes that we don't have in miniature painting. So actually what we are doing, we are looking from behind a raiding party at the camp of Iranians. Between us and the Iranians, what we see is uh, the Turanian raiders who are waylaying the Iranians. So basically, this is a very cinematic uh, way of kind of looking at at the paintings. Um, because this is a cinematic uh, world, the, my audiences, people who read this, their mind, their brain has been formatted by a hundred years of movie making. From D.W. Griffith to the Hollywood of today. So I, I know that they don't have any problem with flashback, with cross-cutting. I keep those in mind when I am uh, telling the story. I am an aqal. I have to look at the people around the coffee house, my coffee house. What are their Im Im imagination? Uh, uh, what is their imagination requiring? What can I work with? And this is a new generation. This is a new world. And so I am a new uh, narrator. I am a new reciter. So I can make this connection and uh, that actually gave me uh, heart and allowed me to uh, overcome my fears and wade into the translation of the Shahnameh. This is another image of the white demon in Shahnameh. Uh, so, the translator's burden. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the difficulties of... Uh, such a translation. Uh, the, for me, the first step was, given the uh, magnificence of the work, uh, the first step was to basically get the courage to do it. Now that I'm 
in the process, I'm thinking, okay, so what challenges do I face? And I'm going to start with, with something that the French novelist Gustave Flaubert said, it is about translation and it is about women. He says a translation is like a woman. And I warn you, fair warning, this is a Frenchman talking 100 years ago about women. So keep that in perspective. He said a translation is like a woman. It is either beautiful or faithful. You can't have both. Beautiful women usually are not faithful. And faithful women are not usually beautiful. So, when I started translating, and I've done a few translations, and especially in this work, I always had in front this sage advice or sage warning in front of me. And I set myself the goal of proving him false every line and every page. I had to prove, prove him false. And this is how I did it. When Gustav uh, Flaubert says that there is, there is some wisdom in this, you know, if you want to, you're, if you're translating a poem, if you want to be faithful, then it's going to be clunky. And if, if you, wanted to, you want to make it beautiful, like many of the translations of Rumi these days that are out there, or are of half as many of these Persian poets, you look at the translation and it's a fool's errand to go and try to find out what they are translating because you know, <laughs> it doesn't correspond to the, to the original. My goal was uh, exactly the opposite. You really have to be very faithful and you have to make it beautiful. This is uh, that rare, uh, that rare uh, creature a beautiful and faithful translation. Now, how can we do this? I think when Flaubert said that, what he had in mind is that something is always lost in translation. And it is true, but not always. Because sometimes, if you have translated, you know this. Sometimes something is gained in translation. When you throw yourself in this poetic act. Translating poetry itself is a poetic act. When you throw yourself in this, there are those felicitous moments when you translate a line and you say, wow, you have done it. It is not only as beautiful as the original, it has new dimensions. There is some alliteration that comes through in the new language that gives it a new luster. There is some witticism, some cultural reference, very subtle. So sometimes you lose something in translation. But take heart, sometimes you gain something in translation. And so this is how you can do it. If you constantly think, oh my god, what am I going to do? I'm going to lose a lot in the, in the translation. Yes, you're going to lose. You lose some, but you gain some. So hopefully my goal was to create this combination of lost and found in translation and create the, the result I set myself the goal of, the, of, of a, a, a translation that is simple but complex in its simplicity. In Persian we say sahle mumtane. That is something that is that sounds very easy but the reader knows that is not the kind of easiness that was gained easily, that creating that ease itself takes a lot of work. So um, you have to find the keynote. In translating this work, I really f had to think hard, finding the right com uh, you know, place between King James English and the colloquial English, somewhere in between to find a kind of consistent form of, of language that would uh, sound true, that would not trivialize the epic and would not make it forbidding. 
And uh, it looks like I didn't expect this. I expected this to be like the bailiwick of people who are very educated. This book has been enormously popular with the teenagers. Teenagers, especially Iranian American teenagers or teenagers of Iranian parents who were born outside Iran and whose second language is Persian, first language is English, they just eat this up. I have had a dozen stories of parents getting this book and saying, okay, this is our family book, this is our tradition, we are going to sit down every night and read a chapter every night, and so I'm going to teach you about the heroes of the Persian um, myth. And the teenagers sit there, politely, and then they disappear into the room with the book, and within a week they are done with the book. I say, okay, dad, mom, this is the book, you read the rest of it, because I'm done with it. And then when their grandparents come from Iran and trying to teach them about the myths, the kids know better than the grandparents about all the, all the, all the mythologies, all the, all the epic. So it, it kind of paid off in a way that I never expected, that it has really reached that place of kind of ease that is, it is attractive to the teenagers. And that is really uh, uh, the most wonderful surprise that I, I uh, encountered. And last but not least, what is very interesting in this kind of work is you have to find in the work that you're translating some unique aspects that will get you going. You have to find, you have to I don't know, I, I, I fear to say this, but in a way, kind of, you have to channel. I don't want to sound too new agey. But, you know, you, you really have to establish a connection with the writer. And in this work, actually, it was easy to do. For a, something, so, so for a very unique aspect of this work, Shahnameh is not like Iliad and Odyssey in this respect. That Ferdowsi doesn't disappear behind the stories the way Homer does. You know, Homer is there in the beginning of the Iliad, and then he says, you know, the muse, come, take me over, and speak through me about the story of the rage of Achilles. There is no more Homer. There is only the muse speaking. Ferdowsi is not like that. Ferdowsi is a poet, and he is very much present. In the beginning of the stories, he, has, uh, he gives you a preamble. At the end, he gives you a finale. And sometimes in the middle, he shows up. He is not like Homer. He's more like a Greek chorus in a, in a tragedy. You know, he can tell you what is going on, the importance of what is going on. And I found this sing-songy, beautiful voice from over a thousand years ago, who speaks in the language that I speak, in the language that every Iranian, every Persian-speaking person from Tajikistan to Pakistan and India and Azerbaijan speaks. And this voice is not only telling me about the, you know, the beginning of the story and the end of the story. The beginning, he sounds a keynote, like generally without ruining the end of the story, he gives you an, a notion of what he's talking about. What is the most important thing in this story? At the end, he talks about the moral of the story. But sometimes he talks about himself. He loses a son at the age of 35. He's saddened by that. He puts it in the epic. So we know he had a son who died at, at the age of 35. He talks about his beliefs. Ferdowsi was a Shiite Muslim. 400 years after Islam, he is singing the praises of the old and pre-Islamic sages, but all the scholars agree that he's, he was a Shiite Muslim. And he expresses his Shiite belief, although he knows his patron is not going to like this because he's a very strict Sunni Muslim. But he's not the kind to kind of preen his religiosity. 
He also drinks wine. He loves wine. He talks about wine. He praises wine. And sometimes he says, maybe I am drinking too much. At one point, he makes a joke. He says, I shouldn't drink so much wine because old age doesn't go with wine. Because when you're old, you're almost halfway there. You're almost drunk. The way you walk, <laughs> the way you talk. So you, know, you don't need too much wine. So ease up on the wine. Sometimes he says, I am poor. Maybe I will not finish this work, this great work that took 33 years to finish. He's in the year, she says, I'm 58, I'm 59. I mean, all, all these come true. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've reached 60. Oh, my God, this is a horrible age, you know. Uh, so after a while, when I was translating Ferdosi, I swear to God, I really felt like he's present in the room with me. With this, speaking with this language, he speaks, if, he, if Ferdosi was today, who, to come alive and go to Tajikistan, go to Tehran, he would not miss a beat. And yet, this is a language from a, thou a man from a thousand years ago. You have that privilege in very few languages. You know, you go back in English for you know, 500 years, it's German nearly. I mean, it's, it's unreadable. But in Persian, the language remains the same. And imagine somebody kind of kvetching to you from a thousand years ago about how he's getting old and he's poor and things are not working out and he's afraid. And, he, and saying, I hope I finish this and I hope that the world will forever remember this great work I have done. No false modesty there. I mean, he really wants to achieve his goal and, and he, he does his work and he achieves it. So I had a feeling that I'm, I'm in, his, in his presence. And that really got me going. I, it was a very difficult job to translate this work, but also I could say that I did it almost in a trance. Uh, I would completely lose track of time. And so this is one of those tricks that translators can use. When you get into the groove, when you get into a kind of a dialogue with the author, that will really help you, that will really uh, inspire you. And uh, so I'm going to end my talk by sharing with you some of the, some of these authorial voice uh, narrations of Ferdowsi. This is Ferdowsi's authorial voice. And the way I express this in my translation, this is pro, uh, verse to prose. When it is Ferdowsi's voice, I used poetry, so it is prose. Uh, it is verse to verse. So the only parts that you see English poetry, of course I went from couplets to triplets because couplets are not used in English poetry anymore. Um, so people who read this book, they, they recognize that this is the voice of Ferdowsi. This is the authorial voice. And so I kind of use this as a narrator. It's kind of, an, it's, it's almost very modern. It's kind of a narrator within the story and the narrator is present. So I'm going to share with you three of these uh, sections just, just to give you a taste of Ferdowsi's personality speaking within the epic. And uh, one of the aspects of Ferdowsi's authorial voice is his, uh, he, the expression of his particular kind of fatalism. This fatalism of Ferdowsi, uh, scholars have traced it back to a particular intellectual um, inclination within the Zoroastrian religion called the Zorvani um, understanding, the Zorvani view of the world. And this is uh, not, it's not clear that Zorvanism was ever really a real religion. It looks like it was a religion of intellectuals, intellectuals who had problems with the theology and the, and the mythology of Zoroastrianism, and so they kind of invented this new way of framing the whole story. And, and, and over the framing device of the Zorvani uh, way of thinking, this fatalistic 
view uh, continued in Iran. And this is 400 years after the Arab invasions. You know, most Iranians have all become Muslim. But this Zorvani fatalism is present in Ferdowsi. So, first example, wo woes of Iraj. Iraj is one of the three brothers and is one of the first great events of Shahnameh. The two brothers, the two, it's like kind of a King Lear situation. The king divides his kingdom between three brothers, and the two elder brothers are envious of the younger brother, who has gotten apparently the best part of the world. One got Rome, one got China, but the little brother gets the best part of the world, which is Iran. He got the best. And the other two said, you know, why are we stuck with Rome and China? How come Iraj gets Iran? A little bit of, you know, ethnocentric uh, uh, conceit there, but, uh, you know, that is the Iranian myth. So they get together and they kill their brother. It's a great tragic story. And at the end of the story, Ferdowsi's authorial voice comes in. جهان او به پروردیش در کنار و از آن پس ندادی به جان زینهار نهانی ندانم تو را دوست کیست بر این آشکارت بباید گریست So on the uh, one side of the screen I have the Persian those of you who read Persian you can follow this uh, but I'm not going to read all the Persian so I'm going to share the English with you. Why did the fate indulge the prince in luxury and ease only to abandon him at the hands of his cruel slayers? The wise know there is no justice in this veil of tears. So there is a, when I say this kind of song, sing songy, complaintive voice that you get used to and you get addicted to, this is, the, this is what I'm talking about. This kind of fatalistic, uh, complaining about the injustice of the world. Another example is, is, is in the great tragedy I refer to, the tragedy of the Sohrab being killed by Rostam. The two knights, one father, one son, meet in the battlefield without knowing. They come from different sides, and they, without knowing each other, they go at each other, and uh, eventually the father tricks the son, and through a trick, he uh, overcomes and kills him. So when the story, before the story starts, this is like the pre classical preamble. Ferdosi is speaking, this is the keynote. Doesn't give out the end, just gives you a feeling of what we are looking for, what, it, what, what you're going to encounter, right? When a wind rips an orange off the branch, before it has time to ripen and grow in its own corner of the ranch, or when a young life is snuffed before its time unfulfilled, what do we call these without being rebuffed? If we claim by some contrivance of the mind that these are acts of justice, then what would we call injustice? A hard example in this, indeed to find. It kind of reminds us a little bit of the biblical book of Job. You know, when Job's friends come and try to explain to him that, you know, everything that's happening to you is justice, some form of justice. And Job says, nonsense, there's no justice in this. This kind of human theodicy, trying to explain evil in the world, that somehow this is justice. And Ferdo says, it says if this is justice, Show me what is injustice. If this world is just, show me a world. How would it look like if it were unjust? And his answer is, we don't know. But we know what is happening in this world. We can't call this justice. You go figure out, figure it out. If you want to explain you know, all the overwhelming goodness of the world, God in the world, be my guest. But I, I don't get it. So this is the, this is the voice of Ferdosi kind of rebelling against this the theological and philosophical attempts to explain away evil. And this is very much in line with Zorbanism. And when in the next tragedy, Siavosh, who is an Iranian prince who defects to the enemy, 
because his father, the Iranian king, is really a god-awful king. That's another aspect of Ferdowsi. Some Iranians think that in Shahnameh is a, the praise of Iranian kings. Nothing is farther from the truth. There are some really awful Iranian kings. And there are some great Turanian, Iranian enemies, uh, the Turanians. There are some great generals among the Turanians. And there are some awful generals among Iranians. There are some good kings among the Turanians. There are some bad kings about, among Iranians. If, if Shahnameh were a, a nationalistic street, a street, like Iranians, white hat, non-Iranians, black hat, we good, they bad, it would not have lasted this long. I think Iranians should be proud of Shahnameh. Not because it says Iranians are always good, exactly because it doesn't say that. Exactly because it is really a true tragedy. Showing people in different situations, whether on the Iranian side, the Turanian side, they have to make the right decisions in difficult circumstances, like all of us. And that is why we can find them ourselves in the heroes of this great work. So when this prince runs away to the enemy and eventually is betrayed by people who are jealous and uh, he's beheaded by the enemy king, uh, Ferdowsi comes in again, he shows up. Story of Siavash, he says, such is this hoary world and its ways. It takes the breast from the infant's lips and the innocent traveler, it waylays. Now, there are some passages in which it's kind of the moral of the story. And Ferdowsi wars against two evils, two moral evils. We have to be on our guard against two great dangers, moral dangers. One is greed and one is pride, the Greek hubris. There is a great Iranian mythological king, the greatest king, Jamshid, who loses his charisma. Again, Iranian kings had this charisma, this halo of kingship that God gave them. But if they were unworthy of it, they would lose it. And Jamshid is a king who lost his charisma and his kingship and his throne he lost it all to pride. And when he calls people and says, I am basically your God, you follow me, I am the king, I am all that. Immediately God takes away the halo and he is denuded of his divine sanction. And here Ferdos, he shows up. It's very interesting, I mean, that story is being told and then we hear the sound of the sage. And this is not the story. This is the author who is penning this line. Uh, he says, it was an excellent piece of advice that a wise man gave to an ungracious ruler seduced by the temptations of pride. When you are made a king, adopt the humility of a slave. Be humble. Don't let it all go to your head, even if you are king. And I insist that it applies to all of us. You know, when we get to a certain position and we have some power and some fame and some money, I mean, cool it a little bit. Just, you know, don't, don't become proud. This is what happened to Jamshi. The second uh, example of Ferdowsi showing up in the middle of the story is when Rostam and Sohrab, the father and son, are, are about to kill each other. They go at each other with all the weapons and they all break. The lances break, the swords break. They are abusing their weapons and they are, have of, they are of equal strength, so the weapons are breaking and they are, they are uh, caked in blood and, and dust and uh, sweat. He kind of, he's very graphic. He portrays the scene, father and son are doing their best to kill each other and they can't and the horses are tired and so they kind of separate. They can't kill each other and they're tired and they want to catch their breath so they can go ahead and kill each other again, try to kill each other. And here in this moment when there is a lull in the battle, we hear Ferdowsi 
authorial voice. The world is full of mysteries as it makes and breaks. Love and wisdom forsook them both, nor did one of them pause to correct his mistakes. Fish, onager, onager was a kind of a zebra, kind of a wild ass, wild donkey uh, creature that is uh, uh, extinct now, but it was greatly, pri greatly prized for, for hunters. Fish and onager and the beasts of burden, even, even donkeys, even horses, in their mangers know their own, but greed so blinded father and son that they faced each other as strangers. What made them blind? When the beasts and animals in the wild, they know their own. What blinded father and son? It was greed. They both belong to the each side. They both have ideas of grandeur. And greed blinds you to the point that you don't recognize your son, you don't recognize your father, and you kill your son and your father. Something that even animals will not do. Animals are above that. But greed will make us subhuman and even sub-animal. And last but not least, I'm going to end with this uh, last piece. I have four minutes left. And I love this piece because this is the beginning of the last love story of Shah Nameh. Bijan and Manije, the Iranian knight falling in love with the Turanian princess. Or rather, he thinks he's falling in love with the Turanian princess. It is actually the Turanian princess who is seducing him. Unbeknownst to him, he thinks he is going to conquer, but he is easily conquered. Eventually, at the end of the night, when he wants to walk away, she drugs him and abducts him and takes him to her palace, the palace of the enemy king. And he wakes up and says, oh my god, what am I doing here? And she says, what's done is done. Let's have fun. And he says, OK. So they have fun for 40 days and night until they are discovered. And the story turns a, a, a very strange turn. And so the fun is over. So this beautiful love story that goes on I mean, so far, I mean, it kind of starts in a comic way, but it turns very tragic, very fast. He is imprisoned in a well, and she is banished from her court, and she is reduced to begging for crust of bread and throwing it down this well so her beloved will not starve to death. And after a while, she's haggard, she's hungry, she has gone from a princess to a beggar, but she never lets go of her love until they are rescued and everything. It, all of these stories, they all have happy ends, so don't worry about, about the love stories. Are, I mean, tragedies don't have happy ends, but all the love stories, ultimately, the girl gets the boy, not the other way around. Now, this story I'm going to end with is the story of the story. And many believe this is the first story Ferdosi wrote down. And this is in the epic. He tells us exactly how he wrote this story. He's asleep in his house. He's having a nightmare. His wife comes. He doesn't say wife. He says, a beautiful one in my house. And treats him to, gives him treats, quince, wine, fruits, and then treats him to a story, but says it's not for free, only on the condition that you turn this into poetry, into Persian poetry. And he says, very much like Bijan said to Manisha, OK. And then the wife goes on to tell this, the love story that we find in verse in Shahnameh. It was a pitch black night that swallowed the stars. 
The moon was anemic and occluded were the planets Mercury, Saturn, and Mars. شبی چون شبه روی شسته بقیر نه بهرام پیدا نه جیوان نه تیر Not even the sound of a bird or beast broke the dense silence and my desolation was complete under the night's raven cloak. I rose with a start and asked my beloved for a light. She brought me a candle and food aplenty to heal my despair and allay my fright. A tray of quinces, pomegranates, and wine to my delight and amused me with the tale of a Turanian princess who fell for Bijan, the gallant Iranian knight. On the condition that once she was through, I would render the tale in Persian prose. This was a fair trade and a pact I agreed to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Sadri. This was a fantastic uh, talk, and actually, it's wonderful to be able to hear the poem. So I'm really glad you read uh, some pieces. I would like to take about four or five minutes for questions. Feel free to get up and ask. And you have um, Dr. Sadri here. And after four questions, I may have to cut it short. But go ahead. Thank you. Is there a camera, a uh, microphone for that? Unfortunately not. In fact, Can after she says the question, you could uh, repeat it. If okay, you I will know. repeat the question. Uh, the question is, how long did it take you to do this transition? Because it's 30 years, you The question was, uh, how long it took me to translate it. Ferdos, it took 33 years. My, t my translation is actually a bridge translation, and I did the first two-thirds. Uh, but I had the advantage of having a computer, and uh, which is a great tool, and really it makes things very easy. It took me about three years, no weekends, no days off. So, and three years of working in this, in this situation of all nearly working in trance. So long days, hard work that didn't feel like it was hard. So it took me about three years. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is whether there is an, a kind of recitation of the, of the Shahnameh. Um, no, there isn't. My version, no, there isn't. I would love to recite it. I mean, I love, I love my, my um, role as a reciter. And you, may, you may have noticed that I really love reading Persian uh, poetry, also reading the English version of this. Unfortunately, there is no kind of audio version of this. I hope one day we can have such, a, such a, uh, an undertaking. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I, I, I love both Persian and English poetry, and I've composed in both English and, po and, and, and Persian. So I have. I am basically familiar with both, uh, but uh, so, so when, when I started translating this, all of that came back to me, and I realized that to translate, you really have to be, like you have a Persian translation, you have a Persian language, or an English language, and you really have to be poetically, your mind should be poetically active when we are, we are doing this kind of work. It could not be done by somebody who, is, who doesn't have that poetic sensibility. And I think I had a modicum of it to see me over. Yeah. One more question? Okay, I have a question. All right. Um, the way that Hamid had talked about the book uh, uh, emphasized it catering to young people and youth. When you were doing the translation, was that really a consideration for you, or you just went with your heart? 
And no, that was not a consideration for me. Um, I really went with my heart. And to tell you the truth, when I was doing the work, I did not think that the youth would like it. Uh, I thought that uh, uh, I thought that this would be a little bit over their, uh, uh, you know, uh, their command of uh, English language. But I am very happily uh, proven wrong that children, the youth, really get into this. They they eat it up, so to speak. They because they like this kind of they they don't. I mean, that's the ultimate lesson is not to underestimate kids, you know. Uh, and uh, fortunately, my underestimation of them didn't w work in my advantage because I was proven happily very wrong about them. But uh, no, I, I really thought that I have to respect the text and I have to render it in a way that it, does it, it doesn't do it any disservice. So I thought... Well, it's, every once in a while you have to look up a word in a dictionary, but that's okay. I learned English in a dictionary in hand, so I think, you know, what if somebody else who is reading my work would pick up a dictionary? That's a, that's a happy occasion when you look up a word. Uh, but it looks like you really don't have to know every word. I mean, the thing is that you kind of go with the flow when you're reading the, you know, Lord of the King and uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, uh, maybe they, you don't understand every word. But these, uh, the youths are, are, are used to that kind of uh, language, you know, the language of, you know, Game of Thrones and, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings. And uh, so it looks like that this is right up there with those, and that is why the, uh, this generation has welcomed it. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming, especially to our wonderful speaker and his lovely wife for coming from such a far distance. Um, we will have more programs. As you see, the surveys on the chairs, feel free to fill one and add your email address if you want us to add you to our uh, email list so that you are aware of our programs that are upcoming. And again, thank you for coming uh, during the middle of the day. I realize it's not easy for people to get away. Thank you. Um, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.